jump into the art of charcuterie and how one speaks the language. Do you mind giving us a summary of how you got to where you are today? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I started out going to culinary school right out of uh, high school and then um, quickly learned how much I loved cheese so much more than most people around me. And um, after culinary school, I, I did help start a restaurant, but I quickly got that itch to like go and work on a farm. So I found a few goat farms out in on the West Coast and worked with a lot of goats and made a lot of cheese, loved it so, so much. Um, and then later on, I was able to work at the cheese counter at Whole Foods, which was my actual dream job. I honestly could have stayed there forever. I did nothing but eat lots of different cheeses and talk to people about cheese all day, which was super fun. Um, and that kind of brings me to now. And now I'm working on a farm and we're getting goats very shortly. So full circle. That's so exciting. And you, you helped with the birthing of goats too. Oh my gosh, 200 babies. It was the most fun I've ever had in my whole life genuinely birthing them like middle of the night anytime each goat would have one to five babies they start walking within 30 seconds it's absolutely incredible 30 second wow yeah no they just get up and start like jumping around it's so cute it's the cutest and thing you've ever seen did you make cheese from those goats that's so cool so you literally and brought them into the world and then well not those babies but their mamas the does. And I, I was also the milkmaid. Like, I got to feed the babies three meals a day for, like, three months. I was, like, the, like a bottle feed. Did they, why did they not eat from their mom? Because we take that milk. Oh. Oh. They get, they stay with the mamas for, like, a week or two weeks and, like, get to breastfeed, like, normal. But then we, then they get separated. They're all treated, they're all so happy, though. They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be a judgmental oh Isabella you and I were both like oh, oh no, I mean, it, was, it was always sad when you had to separate the babies and the mamas but they they get over it in like half a day yeah and they have <laughs> each other then yeah they're they're totally fine so let's dive right into cheese what okay. makes, what makes good cheese are there any defining markers or is it just whatever I like I mean to me Good cheese is made from really happy animals that are able to feed on grass as naturally as possible. Because the more they can do that, the more different depths of flavors they're going to have, the more, um, the more that milk is going to be able to speak for itself. And then when they're making the cheese, they do it as the best cheese, I think, is made out of... Um, milk treated as gently as possible so that all the natural microorganisms are allowed to create those incredible deep flavors that you wouldn't get from normal commercially produced cheeses that are ultra pasteurized and there's like nothing living left so it's just kind of black they're all like in the same mild cheddar family can i ask a question about pasteurization can you give us a quick definition of what that means yeah um, so pasteurizing is basically a technique to kill off bad bacteria in the milk. And good cheese, they'll do a really low, te as low temperature as possible for a longer amount of time to preserve as much of that good bacteria as possible. In the commercial factories, they'll just like crank the temperature way up to like boiling point and it kills everything. And then they just put back in like one little strain of bacterial culture just to make the cheese, but it creates no depth of flavor like the original 
microbiota that are existing in the milk. So when you see something that's marked, this might be a dumb question. When you see something that's marked like with additional probiotics or has probiotics, do they insert different strains of bacteria back into? Yeah, I imagine they add like some kind of um, collection of bacterial cultures into the cheese. It's, that's a good thing mm -hmm. to add. And any bacteria is good because you want your gut to have a lot of diverse bacteria. It's natural and more flavorful also. Whether you have knowledge with cheese or not, you hear people say cheese is moldy. Now, what does that mean when people say that? I mean, cheese is moldy. It gets, I mean, when, um, for certain types of cheeses, you create conditions where different molds will thrive on the rind in order to create certain flavors. So white mold, which we would call bloomy mold, and then blue are very normal in cheese production. And I don't think anyone should ever be scared of those two colors. All the other, and orange, actually. There's a, another type that has an orange rind that's also very normal. But any other types, you should be slightly worried. I always say that if you can cut off about a quarter inch of the cheese and just eat this part that's untouched by the mold, that it's usually probably fine. The only ones that you should look out for are brown and black. Those are like, throw it away. Don't, don't mess with it. So when a cheese is moldy, as long as it's white, orange, or blue, it's probably totally fine. Then that's a positive. Okay. Then I want to eat up that cheese. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's all good. <laughs> and they make it more flavor. They, you know, create those cheese flavors that you know. And you said the word rind. Is that the covering of the cheese? Yeah. That's any part of the outside that's exposed to the air while it's aging. And can you eat that? Yeah. Um, I, it's a personal preference. Some people enjoy it. Honestly, I, don't I usually cut it off but that's just because I like the I like the pure taste on the inside but some people love it hmm. just personal preference I'm gonna have to sit there and try it out because I honestly yeah. I usually cut it off too but now I wonder because would it have more flavor or is it a completely different flavor or texture the rind is usually the funkiest part <laughs> so it's like, like not for the faint of heart you know <laughs> they're not negatively funky but like no. Positively, differently funky. Yeah, funk meaning so much flavor going on, good or bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So when we start trying to pair those flavors, what are kind of the first steps in pairing a cheese, whether it's with food or fruit or, I guess, an entree, fruit, or wine? Well, with entrees, I would say depending on which cuisine you're cooking, you would want to do different cheeses. Like for French food, I always go to Gruyere. It's a classic. Um, for Mediterranean food, feta's great. Pecorino, Parmesan. Uh, obviously Italian Parmesan, like all the way. Um, or the mozzarella or the fontina. Um, if you get into like Eastern European, German food, Swiss kind of goes with everything really well. Um, so that's what I would say for pairing with entrees. You can, you, you can always do a little research, like what cheeses go with which cuisine, and then there's usually a pretty clear answer. Uh, with fruits, I think that's totally like a fun game to play. Like just, just nibble on some fruits with some different cheeses and see what you like best. Because they all go pretty well together, but you're going to find magical combinations that you didn't know you loved. <laughs> um, what was the last one? Wine? Wine. So typically a heartier cheese needs a heartier wine. So like a lighter goat cheese would need like a crisp white. Um, a blue is going to go really well with like a, a lighter red to even a medium or full red, depending on how much, how strong the cheese is. Um, like think of it in terms of strength of wine and cheese together. And then there's an oddball category of stinky cheeses, which are those orange wash rinds I was telling you about. Those go great with beer. Hmm. Oh, wait. So is that in some way connected with how like we typically make heavier like beer cheeses or like heavier things to eat at breweries? Are those like heavier, stronger cheeses? Yeah, yeah. You need need like they just need to be equal in strength 
like a you need like a really a really like savory mushroomy meaty cheese i know it's so weird to use the adjective meaty with cheese but some of them really are that rich um to go with like a like a hearty beer it's you know like denser and I, I don't know <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, I wouldn't say I'm a cheese expert by any means. That's why we have you on, obviously, Katie. And I've always thought that you were like the queen of cheese. But I'm still disappointed with my lack of knowledge of connecting that ladder. Mm -hmm. I've never... Which ladder? Like the ladder of hefty cheese with a stronger wine. I mean, it just, it, you could do it for a lifetime. You could, there's an, an endless supply of times that you could drink some wine and eat some cheese and like learn a new combination that you liked or didn't like. It's, yeah. There's so many, it's insane. Like I, I feel like I've only scratched the surface and I've probably eaten more cheese than most people I know. Do you know a uh, like ballpark number of cheeses you've had? Oh, <laughs> good question. Um, I think I've probably gotten somewhere between 200 and 300 there is a limit like there's only so many cheese producers in the world um but i feel like i've tried the majority of the ones that have entered the mainstream i would like it'd probably be my dream to go and travel around france and find the people that are making like one wheel a day that don't even make it to the grocery store but i think i've tried close to all of the main ones that end up in the grocery stores yeah. <laughs> So when it comes to cheeses, do all of them have to be refrigerated? Why or why not? Most of them do. The longer they sit out at room temp, they're just going to age really quickly. And cheeses go from like fresh to mature. And mm. at mature, they're pretty funky. And again, some people like that really funk. Um, but past that, they, they do start to get to the point where they're like growing molds they shouldn't and they... They develop a lot of ammonia once they get to that mature state, and that's where it's not so good. But basically, the only ones that can actually sit at room temp are the ones that have been aged close to three years. So they're like like Parmesan or a 36-month Gouda, something like that can sit out at room temp. And you'll see them in the grocery stores. They just have them in piles at room temperature. Yeah. Um, but even those can only sit for like 20 days tops at room temp. But could they sit longer if you put them in the fridge? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I've kept a hunk of Parmesan wrapped in a paper towel for, like, six months. Wow. And you, you, you might have to cut off the outsides, but the inside's totally fine. I mean, it's been aging for three years. It's not going to go fully bad. Yeah. So then what does a typical life cycle look like for a cheese? Like, what would it be normal to have it aged? I know nothing about this process. It totally depends on the cheese. There's a lot of different methods of making it, and each method is going to use a different amount of added rennet and microbacteria, um, and they're going to press it more or less. So, um, again, totally depends on the type of cheese, but, like, let's say just for the goat cheese that I was making in Washington, um, it was a bloomy rind, fresh goat cheese so like if you've ever had Humboldt fog or like one of those goat cheeses that has the white rind on the outside mm -hmm. so you make it like normal goat cheese and you form it into the little round it sits in its mold for like I don't know six to eight hours just to get to its shape and um, as it's sitting in there it's always losing moisture so it's getting firmer and firmer into its shape and then you put a special sprinkle of the um, the bloomy rind bacteria, fungus, mm -hmm. and um, it ages for up to like, I think it was about six weeks that that white rind was formed. And that was when it was fully, the inside texture was like goat cheese that you know. And then slowly over time, it would goo out, which sounds terrible, but it's the most oh. amazing thing in the world, I think. <laughs> So it becomes more and more like brie from the outside to the inside. So it's the coolest cheese ever because you get two completely different cheeses in the same bite. You get like goat cheese brie and fresh goat cheese in the same bite. It's so freaking cool. I'm literally and really, salivating and I'm wondering why I didn't cut myself some goat cheese and crackers as an interview. That's fair. <laughs> that would have been a good move. 
Um, anyway, so from that time where it's all the texture of fresh goat cheese to the time where it would be completely goo is like four weeks, I want to say, something like that. But that's a younger cheese. Parmesan is going to literally age two to three years every time. And they just make the wheels and then sit it on a wooden shelf for the whole time. And it just is the same texture inside. It just gets, it loses more and more moisture. So it gets harder and harder. And it grows those salt crystals that are really fun. You know, if you've ever found like those crystally things in cheese, those are salt crystals that form from dehydration. What's happening in my head right now, I was like, we're going to have to have her back on in our coming years to talk about actually the making of cheese because you keep oh it's a whole world yeah you keep like showing us glimpse of magic and i'm like i have so many more questions i know we're gonna have to definitely have another episode in the future that's like legitimately a cheese making i could talk about it for hours (laughs) so if i wanted to start tasting cheeses if i wanted to host a tasting or have one for myself how would i properly structure that would it look like small bites or big bites or would it have pairings walk me through my ideal tasting okay so first of all you're always going to want to let your cheeses sit out at room temperature for like 45 minutes to an hour they will not have their full flavor until they warm up a little bit um and usually that's the sweet spot where they're not like sweating and warm yet they're just warmed up enough to where you're going to be able to taste all the flavors um and then it always makes me think you know in ratatouille when he tastes something magical and it goes into that designed world where it's like a black background but there's like a hint of that pink thing pulsing over here and then like a firework over here that's what it's like where you just have to like let it warm up let it sit in your mouth and just let the fireworks happen and be like, oh my gosh, that's got a little tang to it that I love. And it has that salty thing going on that's awesome. You just have to really pay attention. And it takes a while to develop that skill where you're able to notice all the good things. But with cheese, I would say the things you wanna look out for are like, how salty is it? Does it have any crystals in it? Is it nutty at all? Which sometimes people have a hard time understanding what that, it's like that Swiss flavor, that like nutty, Okay. depth that's like really earthy um you definitely want to i think throw in some of those goodies we were talking about like fruits and nuts and the crackers they can help bring out a lot of those flavors but the tastings are just fun i mean you just just taste a bunch of different there's no rules just taste a bunch of different ones and see which ones make those fireworks happen and which ones you're just like nah i could live without Is there a way to clean your palate? Because you know how sometimes when you go into tastings, they'll have you smell coffee beans or Mm -hmm. is there a way to do that with cheese or you don't do that? I would say water is the best option because anything else that you put in your mouth is going to give you another flavor. So if you really just want to clear it out and be very precise and scientific about it, just drink water with it. Say I'm new to cheeses. Mm -hmm. Maybe I've dabbled in it, but I'm trying to find the quote unquote perfect cheese. Is there a perfect hard cheese, a perfect soft and a perfect smelly, even if that's just your personal preference? It's definitely personal preference, 150%. Like it, everyone's got different taste buds. Everyone has different preferences. Um, for hard ones, Parmesan is kind of the king. I would say. I mean, it's it's pretty fantastic, but I've also, so Parmesan is cow's milk, and I happen to be, um, I happen to, happen to prefer goat's milk cheeses, so there's hard goat's milk cheeses out there that I like better, mm-hmm. and I would grate those instead. Um, for soft cheeses, again, I prefer goat's milk, so it's hard for me to pick anything else as the perfect cheese. There is this one in, I know this might not apply to everyone because you can't access it, but there's this one made on this little island outside of Seattle in Samish Bay that's called Lady Smith, and it's made out of cow's milk, and it is, it has the most depth of flavor I have ever tasted in any cheese in my entire life, so if I were to pick a soft one, that's what I would pick. Um, 
And then in terms of stinky cheese, I think, oh, what was it called? Anyways, Telegio is always a great standby. Fantastic. And when you talked about depth, so trying to put that into like a more of a visual understanding right. for a lack of better terms, like I take a bite and I'm like, mm, this tastes like crisp orange. And then I keep chewing and then I'm like, mm, with a little bit of cherry. And then I keep tasting it. I'm like, oh, and a little almond at the end. Is that what you mean by depth? Pretty much. I mean, mostly what I'm saying is like layers. If you have a block of cheese that you bought from Publix that's like just the standard block of like Monterey Jack, you're gonna get one flavor. And that's pretty much it. But if you taste a cheese that was made like in Swiss Alps, by these beautiful cows that have been munching on fresh grass the whole time. And that grass was, has like, is grown in this amazing soil that's been there for millions of years. And there's so much depth there. When you taste it, it's gonna have like the front note, the thing you taste when you first put it in your mouth. And then it's gonna build and maybe change into something completely else. And then it's gonna build and change into something completely else. And then on the finish, you're gonna have this like lingering, like if Beethoven played the perfect chord softly, you know, like where it just resonates. That's, That's what I mean by depth, where it just has so much complexity that you just can't get enough. And you just like have to keep eating it just to figure out what all those a million parts were because it has so many flavors. That was the most stunningly poetic I've ever heard anyone describe. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> we talked a little bit about the ranges of cheeses and like uh -huh. cheeses and not smelly cheeses. How do I know what a good smelly cheese is versus a not so good smelly cheese? Um, maybe one that it's time to throw out. <laughs> okay. okay. So for me, I would go way more off of the mold than I would off the smell. I don't think that the smell really is any indication of bad or good. Um, it's really gonna be more of an indication of what type of microbiota were used to produce that cheese because each one is gonna make a different type of smell. And one in particular, that wash rind, it literally smells like feet, but it doesn't mean it's not a good cheese. Like it, it's great underneath, you just, Kind of get past it. <laughs> I think it, my, I think my family always called that bum bum cheese. Really? <laughs> that doesn't sound appetizing. <laughs> but it was the best cheese. They were like, yeah. that's the bum bum cheese. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so you also mentioned that you are a tremendous fan of goat cheese or yeah. milk, cheese made with goat milk. Can you identify some of the differences? in tasting that you found between goat milk and cow milk cheese? Yeah. So to me, goat milk always has more of a tang to it. There's a lot of cow's milk cheeses that I think don't have any acidity to them at all. Um, and I, I think that's what I like about it the most. I like, I always like a little bit of tang and I, I can't stand it when it ends up that there's none at all. So goat's milk I find is a bit tangier always and it has a little bit of that again barnyard funk but i think in a good way and then um i would say sheep's milk is kind of in between it's really sweet it's got a lot of sweetness to it but it has like half the amount of funk like right in between cow and goat's milk cow's milk is pretty not funky you sh most of the time it's just like that mild sweet cream flavor that Mozzarella would be a really good example of, where it's just like the simplest thing in the world, almost nothing but that sweet cream flavor. Yeah. I love mozzarella. <laughs> I literally, I'm actually imagining all the cheese I've eaten this past week and how, how many? I've had mozzarella. I've had a slew of different goat's milk because I'm lactose intolerant. Yeah. No, and that's a, that's a good 
pointer that most sheep and goat's milk cheeses are completely fine for lactose intolerant people. I can still have everything. I can have it with wine. I can have it with crackers. Yeah. I like go hard and still feel great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to play a little game. Yeah. In the essence of which cheese you believe is best for a certain dish. So okay. I'm going to say a dish and you give me what sure. cheese you think someone should use. Okay. So the best fondue cheese. I would do a combination of Gruyere and a nice aged white cheddar. And can they find that at a regular grocery store? Yeah, definitely. Gruyere might be more specialty. Um, in fact, I yeah, I don't see Gruyere at every grocery store. Whole Foods, most of the time, has everything you're looking for. Okay. And when they make that fondue, they can just mix those both together and get them all warm. Yeah. Yeah, I would do it. I mean, you got to look up a fondue recipe. It's, you might break the sauce, which you just got to look up the recipe. But whatever cheese it calls for, I like a 50-50 mix of white cheddar and Gruyere. Okay. How about the best mac and cheese cheese? This is a very hard question for me, just so you know, because I literally wrote an article years ago on the multitude of possibilities of mac and cheese and how there's a million ways to do it and they're all fantastic. But if you're gonna look for the classic mac, I would do 75% cheddar of some kind, whatever your favorite cheddar is, and then like 25% Fontina or another good melter, um, just to round it out and to make more depth. You know, you know how I love that depth so much. How about that article? Can anybody access it? No, it was for my high school magazine that they send out every once in a while, but it was all about mac and cheese. <laughs> Maybe we'll find it. Maybe. Yeah. You might. <laughs> now, the best cheese to pair with red wine? For Pinot Noir or something on the lighter end of red, I would say there's this cheese called Cambazola, which is like a cross between Gorgonzola and Brie. So it's like that really creamy, sticky texture, but it has the it has some blue veins in it, so it's got that funk added. I just Are you dying of like cheese starvation right now. <laughs> it's I didn't that was, realize that, that is well because I mean, Katie, I've known you my whole life, and we always bond with food and especially cheese. Yeah. But in this moment, I think was the first moment that I realized whoever I marry will have to speak cheese talk to me because I need, <laughs> I'm going to need that kind of language in my life. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> talk what, Alex? I said, ooh, girl, talk cheesy to me. <laughs> right. That's probably why I've always, well, this is just Isabella's joke, but that's probably why I've always liked cheesy pickup lines. Ha <laughs> ha. Get it. <laughs> Do not edit that out. <laughs> The best cheese to pair with white wine? Oaky or unoaked? Like light and crispy or oaky and like richer? Oof. For the lighter end, I would say the, that like young goat cheese family where like this, the, just the simpler young chef that would be classic goat cheese. That's like the lighter, tangy, it goes perfectly. With and that. then for the oaky one, I might say um, something in the Alpine family, like Gruyere or um, there's a bunch of random ones I could name, but just if you like go to the cheese store and you just say, I need a good Alpine cheese, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. How about the best cheese to pair with beer? That stinky family that we've been talking about. Anything with in the Wash Rhine family, Telegio is the classic example. Robiola is another one. Um, there's a whole bunch. And there's a lot of little boutique ones from France and the Alps that are incredible. My favorite go-to, by the way, just throwing this in there, I've spent hours and hours just going to cheese counters and geeking out with them. And if you, like, make that connection with the cheesemonger and 
you just tell them like, I need to learn, please. I beg you help me. I will buy, I swear I'll buy some cheese at the end of this, but like, let me taste some cheeses and I want to talk about it with you. You will learn. So that's how I started to learn before I had any resources. That was what I did to go and just be able to try the so many, cause they do get a little expensive, but if you go and do that, you can taste a lot of different Sorry, moving on to the next thing. That Don't paired. be sorry. This is good knowledge. The best crumbled cheese. Crumbled on what? Ooh, whatever your heart desires. Okay. Um, that's a tough. I mean, I'm automatically thinking of salad because I can't imagine what else I would be crumbling cheese on. I mean, um, I love gorgonzola in a salad. Gorgonzola dolce in particular. There's picante, which is spicier, meaning like more mature, more funky gorgonzola. And then there's gorgonzola dolce, which is younger, sweeter, creamier, really rich and good. That is so good with candy pecans and apples in a salad, like unbelievably. So I'd, pick, I'd probably pick that one. The best string cheese. Oaxaca. It's from uh Oaxaca Mexico and it's really classic for making quesadillas Ooh. and especially with squash blossoms but it's squash yeah it's awesome like a have you ever seen a zucchini or a yellow squash plant before the squash forms it makes these beautiful big flowers oh. but they pick those flowers instead of the squash and then they just cook them like a vegetable inside the quesadilla that sounds amazing yeah they're awesome. They just taste like that fresh, sweet squash flavor. I'm so hungry. I know. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> The best grilled cheese for a grilled cheese sandwich. Uh, this is just like mac and cheese. We're like, oh, I have the hardest time deciding. There's so many different versions. I, I'm tempted to say you can't go wrong. Like, I honestly think that you might be able to do anything but I would always, no matter what combination you put in there, and I usually do like two to three cheeses because depth. Um, <laughs> definitely include a melter. And this is a specific category of cheeses that I would honestly just look up online, but there's specific cheeses that melt really well. Fontina, mozzarella, um, the mozzarella in a block, not necessarily fresh because fresh is going to like get into that seized up, you know what I'm talking about, like yeah. old pizza mm -hmm. from the fresh month. Anyways, so Fontina is a good one. Havarti's a good one. Anything in the Jack family is going to be a great melter. Just include one of those because you have to have that, like, when you cut it in half and you pull it apart, you need that goo. Yeah, exactly. You've got to have the goo. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly that feeling. Yeah, you do. So now the best nacho cheese. I mean, I would say some kind of really good pepper jack made by some boutique farm in California. Mm. That's pro yeah, mm. a pepper jack, a cla Nacho. you know, classic, because you can't get too crazy with nachos. It's got to go with all those other toppings. You got to fit that niche. So. You are knocking these out of the park. <laughs> we're hitting, some, we're throwing you some weird curveballs, and you are knocking them out of the park. I mean... Cheese is my life. What can I say? <laughs> I know. Katie's like, I'm ready. I am. I'm ready. <laughs> what about uh, what about sparkling wine or Prosecco or champagne? Is there a good cheese that would pair with that for a tasting? I think there's a, a lot of little farms in Vermont that make incredible cheddars. And actually England, for that matter, also it makes a ton of incredible cheddars that have so much complexity and good stuff to them. I think most of those would do really great with champagne or for like that special occasion where you're trying to have nice wine, nice cheese. They'd probably be perfect. Like there's this, um, what is it? Jasper Hill Farm in Vermont in particular that makes a cloth on cheddar that like knocks it out of the park. I have a question. Can you order cheese from any farm that they'll ship it to you in or outside of the country they might ship you a whole wheel which is like sometimes 80 pounds <laughs> so you might not want to go that okay. route um there is a company called murray's 
that's based out of Manhattan, they are the cheese gods. Like, 100%, they do, they're perfect in every way. But, but they have, like, a cheese club that I've been dying to join for years where you get, like, four cheeses a month. But they carry most cheeses. So I think you could probably order mostly whatever you want from them. And they definitely have nationwide shipping, so. There is, I mean, you probably already know, but in the Lower West Side, there is oh, Murray yeah. Cheese. I've been there. I love that place. And the coolest thing about them, they have their own cheese caves. Yes. In the basement. I've never, I've never been, but you can say, yeah, Sorry. Alex, no, say it again. What's a cheese cave? It's where you age the cheese to keep it in perfect condition. It's set at the perfect temperature. It's got the perfect climate for those microbacteria to thrive on the rind. And they have a, so basically once you cut into a cheese, it ages really quickly and it like goes downhill from there. It does not get better. Once you cut it, you have a time limit on the whole thing. So if they keep their cheeses in those caves, they can keep them for a really long time and cut them with so much freshness because they can just take exactly what they need and the rest of it stays perfect. So they, again, they're perfect in every way and they know exactly what they're doing and they do it all the right way. They do. And you can actually go for a cheese and wine tasting. I tried getting it for my roommate's uh, birthday a surprise party. And you can always go to the cheese bar, legitimately yeah. sit there, get any drinks and just charcuterie trays and just. Yeah. That is, oh, so, so, so fun. Whew. That's well, the best way to learn right there. As we're becoming cheese experts, what are some key terms for cheese that we should know? Okay, so first I want to touch on charcuterie. So this is misunderstood most of the time. Charcuterie actually means the art of curing meat. So I know, totally different from what we thought it was. So. It's an Italian word, actually, no, it's French, um, that is literally only for the meats, but because we've started making all these meat and cheese boards, a charcuterie board has become to known as like a board that you put meat or cheeses on. But it really only refers to the meat. So I just wanted to touch on that. Um, it's technically a cheese board if you don't put any meat on it. Um, I know. <laughs> so there's that one. And then um, bloomy is a key word that, like, all the cheese nerds will talk about. How do you yes. spell it? B-L-O-O-M-Y. That means the white rind cheeses. Just any of those white fungus cheeses. They're all um, going to get much funkier with age. They have a shorter lifespan than most cheeses. But they all turn into that, you know, the texture of brie on the inside, that like really sticky, gooey beauty. That's quintessential to the, the white rind actually causes that. And then um, wash rind. So just as the definition, a wash rind cheese is going to be literally washed with a different type of alcohol throughout its beginning stages of life because it creates a wet surface on the rind of the cheese, which encourages a specific type of bacteria that creates that stinky, stinky cheese, the, the bum cheese, as you, your family called it. Um, but that stinky cheese can't be achieved any other way. So that, that orange rind on the outside comes from literally washing the cheese in its early stages. And that's a whole category, the wash rind cheeses. They're usually more savory. And again, they like to go with beer more than any other type of cheese. Um, and then chev, which is spelled C-H-E-V-R-E. -E. Um, people always mispronounce it badly, but that only refers to the very young type of goat's milk cheeses that you find in the logs, like the classic stuff that everybody would recognize. The next question originally was putting together the best charcuterie board, but since I've just learned that charcuterie is not even the right term, putting together the best cheese board. What would you say to someone who's seasoned or a first time cheese board okay. entrepreneur? Okay. Um, so 
if you want to build the big, beautiful board that is super, all over Pinterest, super impressive, tons of colors and things going on, just pick out like, okay, so let's start with cheese. Something old, something new, something stinky, and something blue is a great rule to live by if you're trying to pick out a good variety of things. Something new, meaning something fresh, something that was that doesn't have a rind on it. It's just like a simple pure cheese. Something old, literally being ideally aged like two to three years, like an old Gouda or something. Stinky being that wash rind family that's really savory, funky, and then blue, obviously. And then I always like to throw in ideally like somewhere around three to four uh, different types of charcuterie. Um, ideally, you'd go talk to the person at the deli counter and be like, I really want to pick out some things that are really differently flavored. So I have some variety in here to play with. Some sausages have fennel seed in them. A prosciutto tastes really different from a classic soprasada. Maybe something spicy if you've got an adventurous crowd. Um, and then I always love to go to pick out a lot of different colored and textured odds and ends to throw on the board and just put little piles everywhere like dried cherries dried apricots almonds candied pecans chunks of chocolate a little bowl of honey just tons of little sweet and crunchy things to just play with and experiment with like take little little combinations of everything and then like any cracker is usually totally appropriate most of them are completely fine um, a really classic thing to do is slice up a baguette and toast it and just use that. It's a pretty like pure surface to taste things on. Um, if you want to go for a more little formal, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, an informal cheese board where it's like you have one friend coming over, but you want to have a nice night with them and you want to just like indulge a little bit, just grab like something old and something funky or new whatever you want just like a couple cheeses and slice of a baguette you look you can't go wrong everybody loves freaking cheese and carbs everybody <laughs> always good always so a question with the boards does yes. it matter if it's wood or marble i don't think it matters very much. Honestly, whatever you think, I mean, you're showing off essentially if you're doing a board. You want to be impressive and you want to show off a little bit. So whatever you think looks beautiful, if you want to make it super impressive, get like a bigger one and really spread everything out and create a gorgeous tapestry of colors and textures and like piles of things and, you know, fold your charcuterie and little rosette whatever you want to do to make it really impressive but it's just about aesthetics so whatever you think looks really nice do that there you go perfect katie <laughs> legitimately perfect i have discovered a passion for cheese good and that's just, like my goal so exciting for everyone <laughs> Thank you so much for teaching us so much about this space. You're so welcome. If you could kind of give us like five key takeaways for our listeners, if they want to open this door and learn a lot more about cheese, what would the five key lessons be? First of all, taste a lot of different cheeses all the time. Like build your flavor encyclopedia of all the cheeses so that you can make more informed decisions when you're choosing for whatever reason, for yourself or for these boards, for your friend, whatever. Just build your encyclopedia so that you can taste all the cheeses of the world because it's so fun and you can be super impressive about it. Um, let's see. I think that something old, something new, something stinky and something blue is a really good rule to live by if you're trying to create a a good variety for any occasion. If you're trying to pick an alcohol to go with these tastings, just go for a white wine. It's like so good with everything. It's hard to go wrong. And I, I honestly think it literally goes with every cheese. So that that's a good thing to go with. If you're cooking with cheese, pick a melter when you need a melter. Don't ever go with like an aged Gouda only in a grilled cheese, it won't melt and it'll be the saddest thing in the world. 
you've got to pick a good melter. That is the most important thing. Um, number five. I can't think of a number five. Goat and sheep's milk cheeses, great for lactose intolerant people, and old cheeses are also okay for lactose intolerant people because the lactose is eaten by the microbacteria over time and goes away. So anything, I, I can't remember how many years old it needs to be. Like I wanna say three, but then I don't wanna promise that if that's not completely true. But I know if anything's over, like between three and five years old, you're pretty safe if you're lactose intolerant. So even like an old Parmesan is totally fine for someone lactose intolerant. We're here to open up the world of cheeses for everyone. Everyone deserves this. Yeah, they do deserve it, everyone. Katie, you make me excited as a human being. And every time you bring knowledge in a cheese, I get double excited. So thank you for being on here. Thank you for not only wowing Alex and I, but I know every single person who's listening to this is planning their next social distance cheese board party. I hope so. I really do. Because how could you not? With I want all everyone this- to have all the cheese. Yeah. I really, really do. I thank you, Katie, for coming on and really- You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You're the best. Thank you. Bye.